Good morning. This is the time set for oral argument in our cause number CV 14-0208 ARMC 2011 LLC versus Fenimore Craig. Um, Council, we are recording today's proceedings, so when you step to the podium, please identify yourself and the party that you represent. Each side will have 20 minutes for argument, and Appellant's Council is responsible for watching the clock and reserving any time for rebuttal that you might desire. We have read the briefs and we've conferenced the case prior to argument. So with those preliminaries, is it Mr. Ducharme? Yes. You may, pre you may proceed. May it please the court, my name is Wayne Ducharme, Ducharme Law Firm. I'm representing the appellant, ARMC 2011 LLC. I want to start by reviewing some of the key facts in this case, which are essentially undisputed, and then summarize the significant arguments why the trial court erred in granting summary judgment to Fenimore Craig in this case. This case arises out of the trustee's sale of a commercial rental property. It's nothing to do with the residential property that the courts have decided so many cases on recently. This is a, a commercial property and dealing with a second deed holder, which is my client, ARMC 2011. They had a note of about $816,000, including interest. The first deed on this property was $3,196,000. At the time of the first trustee's sale in 2011, the property had a value of approximately $5 million, well, and that was calculated. Council, yes. I take it though that that value is a value of your expert. Is, is that correct? We didn't get to the expert valuation nor the issue of damages in this case. Well, then where does the five million come from? Yeah, that, that's based upon market conditions where you take the rental value, capitalized value, you take the market value uh, capitalized by the rent that gives you the market value. So it's a calculation that uh, was prepared by my client who has a lot of experience in this area. So it is based on expertise then? Well, it is based on expertise, yes. We didn't get to the point of hiring experts in this case on the issue of damages nor the valuation of the property. The motion for summary judgment was filed on the law soon after the case was filed by us. Yeah, if, well, if the property was worth what your expertise uh, tells you, and then why didn't you uh, 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 initiate a uh, 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 trustee's sale? Because I believe that, and correct me if I misunderstand the record, but I thought that there was a default for a lot yes, not longer. By my, yes, not by my client. That was the, the trustee was hired on behalf of the... Um, the lender, original lender. Well, but couldn't you have uh, thought for closer to uh, satisfy your debt? And then you would have to, of course, pay off the senior lien holder, but if the property was worth what you b b believed it to be, you would have come on ahead. Well, the client, our, my client had no obligation to foreclose. I mean, that's an option that they have available if they're not being paid on the second note. I mean, the second note was a, was a promise by the developer and owner of the property to pay. So my client was, was, uh, relied on that. In fact, the note was paid in part. If you read the facts in detail, I think there was a hundred thousand dollar payment on the note and there was expectations that there would be further payment on the note. Didn't happen. Well, my real concern here is that the, the error that occurred was that your client didn't get, a, uh, uh, didn't get a, a, a notice of the first sale, which we all, which we all agree was error. But that, that error was cured by redoing the, the sale. So I'm not sure why you or we are, are here. 
Well, the reason we're here is because there are substantial damages. Uh, by the time the second sale occurred 11 months later, the property had decreased in value to about $3 million. And so my client did not have an opportunity to recover his note because there was an existing note of $3.1 million on the property, on the but first trust that, The damage only occurs if the argument that the uh, notice uh, was cured through the second sale. I mean, we start from the presumption, or pres not presumption, we start from the fact that the first sale was irregular because your client, the trustee, did not provide your client notice. Correct. Okay. The argument here, before we ever get to damages, but the argument here is that that irregularity was cured through the second sale, and uh, the Finnemore Craig cites the um, um, the CS and W case and other case law that allows a mortgage mortgagee to exercise the power of sale to cure an irregularity in the first sale. Well, our argument, of course, that's. That's Fenimore Craig's argument. That's their argument. Right. Our argument is that that case has been uh, overruled, not overruled, but supplanted, let's shall we say, by recent changes to the trustee sale rules, which occurred in 2011. That case is a 1997 case, 1992 case to CS&W contractors, and that was based on a 1927 Williams case that predated any of the current statutes. And we believe that the statutes, as they were reconstituted in 2011 by adding 33811C, uh, supplanted that and that that is no longer good law. So the what essence... If you, what if you're wrong on that point? Tell, tell me how you can prevail if you're incorrect that the second sale was impermissible. If we were to determine it was appropriate, CSNW, whatever other authority, tell me how you then can still prevail. Well, let me, before I answer that question, let me just say that if CSNW case is allowed to stand and, re and remain good law, basically it's usurping the power of the court to oversee a second sale and overturn, and overturn a, a valid sale that would have tremendous impact not only in chaos in the industry like i said but also with respect to a purchaser who is not the beneficiary um and in this case the beneficiary was conducted the second sale but, but your client could have as to the second sale um under the statute gone in to seek conjunctive relief or you could have appeared at the sale i mean there are a lot of things you could have done vis-a-vis -vis the second sale that were not done, so I'm not sure I follow your argument there. But, but again, just for the sake of argument, if we think the second sale was appropriately conducted, how, does, how can your client prevail still? Well, the damages are occurred because at the second sale... Oh, but you don't get to damages unless you have a viable cause of action. So yes. what viable... Because your, your complaint is a one-count negligence per se complaint, and yes. the only allegation is as to the first sale. And so if we find that the second sale was appropriate and cured the deficiency of the first sale, um, what's your cause of action? What is the negligence per se that is actionable, assuming the second sale was appropriate? Now by the time that the second sale occurred 11 months later, the value of the property had decreased to such that there was no action that my client could take. I get that, but that's not negligence per se, and that's the only thing you've alleged. The only thing you've alleged is that the failure to give notice of the first sale was negligence per se. So. What is negligence per se? What remains of negligence per se if the second sale was appropriate? Well, in the Steinberger case that this court decided in 2014, the court addressed the issue, and that's not in our briefs. No, but, but part of the problem is how this is pled. If you had pled general negligence, we'd have a whole different discussion here, but you've alleged negligence per se is your only claim. And yes. so Stein, that doesn't really help us with the pleading that we have before us in this well, case. Steinberger addressed the issue of negligence per se, and allowed it to uh, go forward or allowed that cause of action in a trustee sale action. And that was it. Well, the court did allow that. The court said because the court stated that the homeowner raised substantial issues that could not be cured by renoticing a trustee sale. 
So our, situ our position is the same. And the reason here is, like, like the court said, the homeowner would still face the loss of her home after a re-notice trustee sale. Only the trustee and a beneficiary would benefit from a reconducted sale. So we have a problem here. We have a problem that there's no... Steinberger in your briefs? No. Okay. So this is a new argument, or at least new authority. Um, could you give us a citation now? Absolutely. So that's a case that I found in pre pre preparing for this hearing. Did you, si did you file a notice of supplemental authority so that opposing counsel would be prepared to address the case? I did not. The site is 234 Arizona 125 318 P3 419 App 2014. Okay. So that's the site. And, and the court, that's exactly what the what the trustee and the and the title company wanted to do in that case was have a secondary sale to cure all the defects in the first sale. And the court said that's not going to cure the defects. What was the defect in that case? It had to do with the uh, improper authority of the trustee to conduct the sale, improper authority of the officers of, of entities to sign and so on and so forth. So there was, That's there wasn't the, a notice I think case. Andy Gould, my That's colleague. Andy Mac case. Yes. The, okay, in the Andy Mac case. Yes. Okay. That, that's right. So our damages were, and I, I, I tried to emphasize that, was that by the time the second sale, there was no equity left in the property to deal with. But there was no, no action we could take. Forgive me, but there was, there was only equity in the first sale if your valuation was accepted, and I have a feeling that that was greatly disputed. Well, we never got to the issue of damages. We only got to the issue of liability, and that was the basis for my motion for subject judgment at the trial court. And so we're asking the court to allow us to go for a trial on the issue of damages. Well, the other thing about negligence per se is that it is designed to afford a cause of action to enforce some sort of statute or regulation designed for public safety. Yes. Um, how does this fit within that rubric? Court, excuse me. Again, the court addressed that issue in the Steinberger case. That case overruled the trial court's dismissal of the homeowner's claims for negligence per se, cause of action arising out of a trust deed foreclosure sale. They, they, the court analyzed whether negligence per se would apply. And of course, as you just said, Judge Downey, that a negligence per se must be enacted for the protection and safety of the public. And the court determined that in that case, violation of the trustee recording statute was enacted for the protection and safety of the public. How is the known as the requirement of the ticket for public safety? Or well, in the benefit? same way, we're drawing an, an analysis to the fact that the, the, the trustee statutes are there to protect uh, secondary deed holders. I mean, there's a statute, 39809A, where they have to receive notice. They're there to protect the beneficiary. They're there to protect the truster who might lose title to the property. So it is for the safety of the public. It's not a very far jump to say that that when you're trying to protect the truster from losing title to its home, that losing title to uh, the value of the trust deed in a commercial property is similarly. So the, the court did, in that case, say, and they evaluated the court. There's a long list of reasons here why the court evaluated whether the statutory purpose of the statute would prevent the court from adopting a statute as the standard of conduct. And they went through a long list, and the court found that there was no good reason to refrain from adopting the negligence per se standard for failure to conduct a proper trust deed sale. But, and we you know, say that applies here. We're at a disadvantage because you've raised this case late, but I'm reading it now, and the reason the court reached that conclusion about negligence per se is these were homeowners who were losing their home to yeah. foreclosure. That's yes. a quite different circumstance than what we're looking at here. 
Well, it is, but my client is losing the value of his trust team, and it has value to him. Well, but, but when you talk about the policy behind public safety and all, it, it's yes. quite different because we've got the anti-deficiency statutes and everything that set the public policy of Arizona for homeowners, which is quite different from these circumstances. I mean, we've got to analyze a case that you're citing for the first time today, but I think there's some significant distinctions in that that I'm not sure apply aptly to a negligence per se case in this context. But You know, go, go, going back to your argument about the, uh, the legislature's addition of subsection C to 33.811. Yes. Um, the, real, the problem I'm having with your argument here is that um, I guess your argument is you, you on the second sale you received notice, or your client did, and the cl your client took no action to enjoin it. That's correct. Right. Well, there was no financial value in doing so because the value of the property but, had but decreased. But that's an argument I think your client needed to raise to the judge to say that second sale should not go forward because we have been damaged. There was an irregularity that cannot be cured and the second sale should not go forward. And instead of doing anything, I mean, the language of the statute is clear, unambiguous. If you want to stop it, you've got to do something. Otherwise, any defects are barred. I mean, we're, we are required to follow the language of unambiguous statutes. That, that's what our obligation is. So I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling with how I get around that. I don't disagree with you, Your Honor. Yeah. What I'm arguing is that to allow a second sale at, at the option of the trustee or at the option of their insurance company to go forward, they are adopting judicial, uh, quasi-judicial position here. They can overrule a, a sale that's been let's say, to a bona fide purchaser. But uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. If we had a BFP, we'd have a different situation. We don't have a third-party buyer. We have the mortgagee, yes. the uh, um, Carlin. Let me check my flow chart here. But Carlin, who bought it the first time, who was the mortgagee, and bought it the second time. So, uh, again, this is not a bona fide sale. We would be in a vastly different situation if we had a BFP. Well, the statute would protect the BFP oh, yeah, as absolutely. a conclusive presumption. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me finish this argument by saying that uh, ARMC did not waive its claims against Fenimore Craig on the first sale by not enjoining the second sale. And I think that's your question that that's you're asking question. me for. Right. Claims for relief, defenses, and objections that are independent from a contest to the trustee sale are not waived by 33811C. The statute does not restrict claims for relief that are independent of voiding the trustee sale. That was a FSEP case. Our district court in 2012 decided that. But going to the state court case, Morgan, Arizona Financial LLC versus Goddess, uh, the trustee does not waive defenses to post um, deficiency claim by a lender. That's so that, a post deficiency claim. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I understand that. But BT Capital also cited, and that's the case before the court, that, that trial court relied on, 33-811-0110 and 33-807-E could be the basis for a claim by the trustor against the trustee. BT Capital recognized that tort and contract claims for damages are distinct from claims to title for property, title to property, and therefore may survive a trustee's sale as in BT Capital, and that was supported in, in fact, uh, both of us cited some uh, California cases which the trustee statutes are very similar, and then Biancala versus TD Service, uh, 56 Calap 48821, 2013, that's in our briefs, says we do not condone negligence by the trustee. The trustee is liable and a trustor or beneficiary has any remedy available to it in contract or tort, not just through the trustee sale and adjoining the sale. So there's a lot of law supporting the fact that outside of challenging the sale, that there are remedies available to somebody who has been harmed by an improper first sale. And if there are no further questions, I'd like to reserve a minute or two uh, for my rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, Your Honors. <coughs> David Rammers for Fenimore Craig. I, Fenimore Craig's motion for summary judgment below was based on four independent grounds, each of which separately would sustain the grant of summary judgment as a matter of law. The trial judge granted the summary judgment but did not specify which of the, of the four grounds it, he was relying on. The judgment could and should be affirmed if any one of those grounds is applicable. Therefore, I'm going to address each of them briefly now. Initially, RMC, I'm referring to ARMC as just RMC, RMC argues that neither Fenimore Craig nor the title company that issued the TSG could reconduct the trustee sale. In reality, neither of them did that. The only party that had the right or the ability to reconduct the trustee sale was Carlin. It was its deed of trust. And Carlin had that ability, and it did so pursuant to CS&W. So the next argument that, that RMC raises uh, is... Before you move on, what about um, the, Mr. Deschamps' argument that the amendment to 33811C changes and basically overrules or supersedes the uh, CS&W case. The, the interesting thing there, Your Honor, is that CS&W, at the time CS&W was, was decided, 33811B, which is the one that they're relying on now, is, was the same. It was identical. Uh, nothing has changed since then. At the time of the CS&W case, there was nothing in the trustee deed statutes that permitted a reconducted trustee sale, and yet the court allowed it. Now that there's been an amendment, there's nothing in the amendment that even addresses this that says now you can't not have a reconducted sale. So basically, counsel is saying that CS&W has been overruled but doesn't assign any authority, doesn't point us to a statute, and the statutes are the same. They were the same in 90, 1992 and the same as they are now. So your argument, if I understand it, is that the addition of subsection C is basically irrelevant here. I think, uh, I, I won't say it goes so far as to say it's completely irrelevant, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, I think the important thing that I saw in the, uh, in, in the in Ray Chrome case is this. We have a statutory proceeding, and normally we look to the statutes for everything, especially if you have a comprehensive statute like this. And the question then that arose was, well, what exactly does the court's authority, what is left of the court's authority? If it's only but we've got to look to the statute, what can you do? And in Ray Chrome was, is critical in that regard because it's the same, although in CS&W they were relying on judicial foreclosure cases to, that said that you can reconduct a sale in the event there's someone missed, and missed a, a, a junior lien holder. But in In Re Chrome, it went one step further and said, well, even though this is a statutory proceeding, we still, the court nonetheless retains its equitable powers to oversee a trustee sale under the statutes. And the reason why is to assure the debtor, who has no control over this entire proceeding, has fundamental fairness procedurally and substantively. So in this case, I would find it hard to imagine a case more ripe for a court to intervene uh, if that had happened here, with its equitable powers that Chrome says you've retained. We're in a case where a junior lien holder received no notice of, of the sale, and uh, the sale would wipe out his junior lien. I mean, we know that basic principles of due process say you can't be deprived of your rights without due process. You've got to have notice and an opportunity to appear. So in this case here, RMC, uh, if, if RMC had come in filed their, sought their injunction to try to show that the first sale was no good uh, or to show that it still had some rights, it would raise the due process argument. And frankly, it would be a winner. I don't see how anybody could object to it. Uh, but it didn't. And instead, Carlin invoked its own self-help remedy of reconducting the sale. The purpose was twofold. One was it was concerned. We're talking about it just bought this property whether it's worth one million, three million, five million, whatever the number really is, I don't know. But here it is now, it's now it has title to this property. It's gonna either sell it or it may get an, a, a, put a new mortgage on it and use it as an income producing property. So now when it gets ready to go to a lender or to a buyer and it's gonna sell it, if he came to me and he said, do I have an obligation to disclose that there was no notice given to RMC in the trustee sale that, ar that arose out of my trustee's deed? I'd be nervous to tell him, no, you have no obligation. 
So if he says that, now what is he going to do? That property, that title is now no good. That title has, is all screwed up, and the only way to clear it is how. How do you clear it? You reconduct the trustee sale, just like they did in CS&W. You know, in most cases that would come before this court, I think a buyer uh, at a foreclosure sale, uh, maybe a BFP would come in and say, hey, I was relying on this trustee's deed, and, and now you're saying it's not, it's not uh, uh, final. But here we have a very bizarre case where the junior lien holder himself is adamantly arguing that his lien was foreclosed, that he no longer has any interest. He's arguing against his own interest. But that's the position that they take. And, by, and because of that, and because of the due process issues, Carlin said, okay, we're going to reconduct the trustee sale. We have authority in CS&W. Once they did it, why didn't? Why didn't they come in and do something? This goes to the question of value. Can I, can I interrupt because I feel very dense, but you said there are four independent grounds to affirm. And you, you started by saying the first is that only Carlin had the right to reconduct the sale. Um, I, I'm missing the link about how that's a basis to affirm. What, what's your argument as to that first grounds for affirming? The first grounds relates to the right to have a reconducted sale. Okay. That's the first grounds. And, and we're saying that under CS&W and the progeny. Carlin could do it. That and Carlin so could how do does it. that get Fenimore Craig off the hook? Well, it gets it off the hook because if you have the right to reconduct the sale, then we go. Then that's when Your Honor asked, well, is C not relevant here? Well, it is relevant because once they reconducted the sale, they gave notice to, to RMC. RMC then had an obligation. If you think you can't do this, we can't do this, the court can't do whatever it is, seek an injunction, make these all, are these arguments. So you're not arguing that the second sale cured the first sale? The reconducted sale? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what I'm arguing. I'm saying, and that's really the, the position in CSNW. How do you fix this problem? And in this particular, in our circumstance, it's much easier than when you, if you had the BFP. And I, I have an answer to that one too because I've been thinking about that. Good. What's the answer? Well, if you if you think about this case, th there's there's two provisions that are somewhat inconsistent. B says it's conclusive. C says, well, unless you receive notice, you, RMC, did not waive your defenses mm -hmm. or claims. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we have a trustee sale, let's say a BFP, not our case. I, I hate to get into an argument about what's not before us, but you've got a BFP. He comes in here. Now he says, I thought it says it's conclusive. And the junior lien holder says, but I didn't waive my defenses. How do you... How do, you, uh, how do you adjust for those two, what seem to me to be inconsistent provisions? And I think it comes down to a case of, of, uh, of statutory construction. Statutory construction, we know the rule. What was the intent of the legislature? And the intent of the legislature was, let's make sure that whoever ends up with, at this sale, that there's, there is uh, some, um, some finality and certainty to, who, to what you get. So in this case here, what do we have? We have the opposite. We have uncertainty. We have, uh, we have Carlin in a position where, geez, I went through this thing. I got a trustee's deed, but I know he didn't get notice. I know there's a due process problem. What do I do? And what I'm suggesting to the court is that if, in that case, which is not before us, you got that position, I think you'd come to the same result. I think you'd have to tell that BFP, you know what? It says it's conclusive, but it also says that this, uh, this party didn't waive his defenses. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you make those two make sense? And I think you have to construe it in a way to give the intent of the legislature some, the spirit and the purpose, finality, certainty. How can you do that but for having a reconducted sale? And the only way for ARMC to, <coughs> to preserve its objections is to seek an injunction of the second sale. Exactly, exactly. So, is it a double-barreled argument in the sense that any error is cured and ARMC has waived or uh, uh, forfeited any uh, argument it may have by not uh, enjoying the second sale. Exactly, and 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 the 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 foreclosure of those defenses and uh, objections 
we know there's, it has it has twofold uh, consequences. The Madison versus Grosseth case tells us, well, if you've waived your defenses, you also waive any related tort claims. And so that's exactly what they have here. They've made a tort claim, but if they've waived the defenses, they've waived the, the related tort claim, which in this case is the, is the negligence per se. I mean, that's clearly true as to Carlin, and I'm just trying to figure out how Fenimore Craig receives different treatment if it does. Um, but you, you think that the same protections that Carlin would enjoy as a result of the second sale um, preclude the claim against Fenimore Craig? I think so, because, because exactly, because it's all related to the same argument. You didn't give notice. Those are the notice things that there's a presumption or finality or whatever. But if he didn't waive his defenses, how can it be final? I mean, there's an inconsistency, I think, in the statute. So we, we the harm comes from the the failure of notice, and if that fa that failure is cured, then uh, AMC has no basis to no, no uh, 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 complain about anything. I think that's right. I think so. They're they're one and the. They're one and the, the same as no separate negligence claim as to the as to the error in the first sale that survives the second sale. Exactly, exactly. And and your honor asked me, well, you you know, there were four separate grounds. We kind of exhausted, I think, the the idea of, of whether you can have a reconducted sale and. But in this case here, as I said, there were four separate grounds. The judge could have granted summary judgment on any one of them. Isn't duty kind of the cleanest? It is. Absolutely is. And, and, and the duty claim is answered, I think, directly by BT Capital. I mean, BT Capital, they, the, the, the guy that bought the property at the sale that was complaining that nothing, you know, he should have gotten his trustee's deed, he sued the trustee. And the trustee and the court came back and said, wait a second. This is, number one, this is a case involving a very comprehensive statutory proceeding. There is nothing in this deed of trust statutes that give a claim against a trustee for screwing up. And went on further to say, and there are no common law claims that survive because this whole area has been preempted by the statutory scheme. So in BT Capital, there is no claim. And they and they, they specifically said that. So you're right. That is the absolute cleanest thing, and maybe that was what the trial judge went off on. Because in a negligence per se setting, which is all we have here, it is inextricably tied to the statute. So it seems BT Capital answers it as to a negligence per se. If we had some sort of free-floating common law negligence claim, I don't know the result. But we're dealing here with a single allegation of negligence per se, correct? I think that's correct. But there's another independent reason for uh, for why the summary judgment below could have been granted, and that is that let's assume there was some other f negligence kind of claim floating around out there. Uh, the question then, it, it comes back to what did Fenimore Craig do that would be negligent? It In the summary judgment proceedings below, we submitted affidavits that said, number one, the standard industry practice is you order a TSG from a reputable title company. We did it. Second thing is, when you get the TSG that tells you who you're supposed to give your notice to, we did it. Did you know, you those things are not as clean because they get into breach, and breach is almost always a question of fact for the trier of fact, and, and I, I know there are exceptions, but don't you think that's more problematic than the legal issue of duty? It's less clean, you're right, and uh, but because the issue of, because it's undisputed, don't, don't forget, at this point, when we filed a motion below, they, we looked at their 26.1 disclosure statement, no experts were disclosed that we were going to say, you didn't follow industry practice, well, you don't have a right to rely, and n nothing like that. So well, this record, I, I, I hear your point, I, I see your point. Um, the bill, and I call the plaintiff here the builder just because it's a little bit easier word to use. Um, I think there's an issue whether uh, the trustee here uh, obtained a bring down report. It's one thing to order a, an initial um, um, trustee sale guarantee that's going to be 
probably prepared a hundred hundred days out or thereabouts. But my recollection of what industry practice is is that the trustees should have gotten a brain down report maybe just a few days before the a trustee sale, which would have disclosed this additional lien. It's and, possible. And, and that's nothing, in, I don't know if that's anything in the record. It's not. Okay. It's not. Um, I will tell you, though, when I looked at this to begin with, and, and I do a lot of uh, this type of work, and I, I was trying to figure out how, how did the trust, how did the title company miss this in the first place? And I think the answer we can look at, we can see, don't forget, this note was out there for like two years before the trustee sale. When did they get a deed of trust? January Days 24, before. 2011. Yeah. Days before this first trustee sale. Well, uh, excuse me, the junior lien was recorded on January 24, 2011. And Finmore Craig noticed the deed of trust sale uh, on February 4, 2011. So there was, there was a, a six, a, you know, roughly two weeks there. Yes, yeah. there was. Yeah. There was. I, how well, how they missed it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think the question and the reason why I raised this issue, although it's not as clean as the duty question, it is still clean in that the Dedeker case, which is the California case that I cited to you, same exact situation. And the court said, hey, what is this? Okay, you got to have a duty. You have to have a breach of the duty and causation and damages. What was his duty? Well, I mean, the court said, what is this lawyer, in this case, Fenimore Craig, supposed to do? What were they supposed to do? Did they do everything they were supposed to do that norm that's normal in the, in the industry? They ordered a report. They relied on the report. They had no knowledge, actual knowledge of the lien. How could you be negligent for that? Dedeker said you can't. As a matter of law, you can't. And so in Dedeker, the trustee was, was, was uh, found un not liable for that independent reason. So you've got four separate, completely four separate grounds. Any one of them could sustain this, Your Honors. And the only thing I would like to mention to you, aside from I, I'm, a, I'm afraid that I'm ignorant about the Steinberger case. It wasn't cited, and so it's new argument. I would ask you to, discon to, to not consider it because of that. But let's go back for a second. Council keeps saying, well, this delay from the first sale to the second sale, it caused us damages because the value of the property went down. Now, we know there is not a single bit of competent evidence in this case about what the value of the property was before, during, or after. In their brief, they admit that, that they're, the member of RMC is not an expert. Uh, and of course, he isn't. Um, but think about it. What caused this delay? Well, the delay from the first sale to the second sale it's, it was all caused by RMC. This default was a year before the trustee sale. They delayed until the first trustee sale. They delayed until the second trustee sale. They never did anything. And talking about damages, how do we know they've incurred any damages? There's nothing in the record that shows they can't collect this money from the, from the developer who, who gave them the promissory note. They still have a remedy against him. Their second lien has been foreclosed, but they always knew their second lien was a second position. And so, and the final thing is that council also said the damages were not addressed below. They were addressed below in that once uh, RMC's member provided an affidavit saying this is the value of the property and we contested and say, hey, wait a second, this guy is not an expert. There's no qualifications whatsoever. And so the damage, exp the damage issue was addressed and they couldn't show any damages. So all of those possible reasons why they may have been able to raise something, none of those issues were raised before the court. In our case, nor were they, nor were they raised or could have been raised in the injunction proceeding. With that, Your Honor, I have nothing further unless you have any questions. Thank you very much. Brief rebuttal, Mr. Ducharme. First of all, what did Fenimore Craig do wrong? That's a question that was put before the court. They failed to give notice to my client so he could protect his interest in his second trust deed. I don't think it's sufficient to rely on the uh, guarantee report. I mean, I do a lot of mechanics lien cases in my practice, and maybe counsel has done the same. I always go online myself 
and take a look and to see who has filed a lien, who has liens on a project. Even though I might get a litigation guarantee from a title company, I believe it's incumbent upon counsel who has a responsibility for giving proper notice to take a look at the statute just before the sale. Take a look at the, at the recording statutes to see what, what recorded. They didn't do that. So that's what they did wrong. Now, he keeps saying Adam Mays is not an expert. Adam Mays has been doing construction on these types of rental properties for 20 or 30 years. He knows what the values of the property are. He works with a lot of developers. They give him information. Carlin gave him information about the value of the property. He, Carlin told him in an email, which is part of the record, what the property was worth at the second sale after the rent had been reduced on a long-term lease. So Carlin had a lot of advantages in, um, in conducting a second sale for his benefit. Now, why should Fenimore Craig get off the hook for not giving my client sale? Okay, Dideker said you don't have a common law, a common law duty to give notice. This is a statutory duty to give notice. It's not a common law duty. And in fact, that, that Dideker case was in 1997. Your time's up, so if you want to finish this thought or another, you've got yeah. one more thought to share. I have one more thought. I thought I have 55 seconds. That was that's, his leftover that's his Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ran over. Okay. You can have his 55 seconds, but that's not oh, obvious. Thank you. <laughs> the BT Capital case by the trial court was decided on the fact that there was so-called multiple sales, so-called three sales, but there was not one, only one sale, only one completed sale. So that case did not support CSNW, which was never mentioned in the BT Capital case. The In that case, there were some errors made by the trustee in giving notice the time of the sale and so on and so forth. So before the sale was completed, he conducted a third uh, approach at the sale. That was completed. That became final. So there was no second sale. There was only one sale. And we believe the trial court got it wrong. My client was damaged and is entitled to a claim against Benamar Craig for its damages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentations. We will take this matter under advisement and issue a ruling in due course. At this time, the court stands adjourned. Thank you.